lecturer at the Department of Molecular Sciences at Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. His research interest is focused on yeast metabolic pathways and how they can be applied, among other things, in the engineering and production of food. Thank you for joining us, Thomas. I will let you have the word. Well, thanks for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. So, now I'm going to <laughs> uh, say everything opposite to what Ula just said. So I'm going to be talking about uh, microbes and eating microbes um, and how uh, edible microbes can revolutionize our global food system. So I like to sort of try to boil down everything to its essence. And if we think about the foundations of our food system, what is it we want? Well, we want capacity. We want to be able to feed everyone. We want sustainability. So we want to be able to preserve natural environments. And also we don't want to undermine our ability to produce food in the future. So we don't want a conflict with the first point. And then finally, we want resilience against any kind of global shock. So extreme weather events that we've seen this year uh regional conflicts or global wars pandemics uh volcanic super eruptions asteroid impacts alien invasions all those kind of things that's what we want so what i'm going to talk about today is three things first i'm going to give you a very sort of deconstructed view of the global food production system then i'm going to dis agriculture a bit uh and then i'm gonna gonna say why microbes are so amazing so if we start by looking at um, the, the food production system at a really minimalist level, it looks like this. So down here, hope you can see my cursor. This is us. Our bodies, composed, uh, we're mostly composed of protein, hopefully not too much fat, and a little bit of carbohydrates, okay? That's what we need to build our tissues, and we also use these compounds as fuel to power our metabolism. Now, the problem we have, this is what food is about, is that in order to make these compounds, we need three elements. We need carbon, we need nitrogen, and we need sulfur. And the cruel joke here is that we cannot biochemically access the most common forms of these compounds out in nature. We cannot assimilate carbon dioxide, we cannot assimilate nitrogen gas, and we cannot assimilate uh, sulfate ions. So what is it we do? Well, we use a proxy. So we eat other organisms that can do this. So the simplest one is plants, right? So plants, they can assimilate carbon, carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. Um, uh, uh, some plants um, form um, symbiotic relationships with nitrogen fixing soil bacteria so they can fix uh, nitrogen gas such as legumes in here. And pretty much all plants can, can assimilate sulfates without any problem. And then they, they are the ones that make the carbohydrates, the lipids, the fats, and we eat that and we just basically steal it from them. Now, of course, the variation on that is to put one more proxy in, and, and Ulo already talked about this, is to have an animal that eats the plant biomass and then we eat the animal. And a good, good reason to do this is, for instance, again, Ula mentioned this, is that we have animals that can digest cellulose, which we cannot digest. So these cattle here, for instance, they can eat grass. They can get, they can get um, carbon out of the grass. We can't do that. So they, they form a sort of good biocatalyst for us in the middle. Uh, or, for instance, filter feeders like this oyster, which can, will sit patiently in the ocean and, and filter out phytoplankton that we could not do efficiently. And then we eat the animal biomass and we get mostly protein and lipids from that. So let, let's start plugging in uh, microorganisms into this, this process. So this is one you all are probably familiar with, microprotein. Many of you have probably tried corn products but there's a couple of other players in the field now. So what does it look, what does the flow chart look like now? Well, so microprotein is basically a filamentous fungus that does not produce fruiting bodies. Now it can take up sulfate on its own, no problem. Uh, it cannot fix nitrogen, so we have to do that for them. So we have an industrial uh, nitrogen fixation process here that captures nitrogen, turns it into ammonia. And then the ammonia can be fed to the microorganism and they can produce protein from that. But then the way we like to do it is that we feed them sugar. So either uh, sugar from, from sugar cane or sugar beet or even glucose. 
So we still have sort of an agricultural element in here and, and photo, oh, oops, Let's see. Um, uh, photosynthesis is still involved here. Um, or we can do we can do microalgae. So for instance, uh, for those of you who have tried um, spirulina supplements, uh, it's it's pretty much the same as a plant. You know, you have carbon fixed by photosynthesis. Again, sulfate can be assimilated directly. Some species can fix their own nitrogen, otherwise we have to feed them uh, ammonia. But it's, it's kind of um, pretty much the same thing as plants, except there's not much carbohydrates we get out of them. Now, what interesting things can we do with, with uh, microorganisms? How can we shake this up a bit? Well, so there are a number of companies now that are rediscovering a, a technology from the 1960s which use something called chemosynthetic bacteria. So what these bacteria do is they can also fix carbon dioxide exactly like those microalgae, but they do not use light to power this, this process. They use chemicals. So for instance, hydrogen gas. Uh, I don't think most of them can probably not fix nitrogen, so we need to produce the, the fixed nitrogen for them, but they can pick up the sulfate. And what's interesting here, of course, is now here suddenly we have we have cut out photosynthesis. We're producing food without photosynthesis, and hopefully, uh, solar foods in Finland will hopefully soon have a product on the market, so we can actually see how it performs and if consumers are willing to eat it. And then I, I just want to show a final uh, scenario that no one is doing at the moment, but which I am really excited about, which is, is kind of a variation on, on the previous chemosynthetic bacteria. But here, what we are doing the carbon fixation. So we are capturing carbon dioxide, and then we do a chemical conversion to different forms of simple organic compounds like methanol, formic acid, or acetic acid, and then we grow microorganisms on those. And there's a lot of different microorganisms we can grow that way. And again, what's interesting here is now we completely independent of photosynthesis again. And this is mostly for protein production, but it's also possible to produce lipids. Okay, so that was my, my quick deconstruction of the, the food production system. Now I'm going to dis agriculture a bit here. Um, but before I do, I just want to say, okay, agriculture, it was the key innovation that enabled development of complex societies. And I, I believe that farmers are the most essential people in our societies today. If they disappear tomorrow, our global society would collapse within days. So I, I have a lot of respect for farmers, so don't get me wrong here. But that being said, first of all, agriculture has potential, you know, they, they, it has destructive potential. Because the first thing you have to do is, if you want to grow a crop, you have to remove what was growing there before. You cannot get away from that. Um, pasture is another story. Like, like Ula said, the, the grazing thing is, is a bit more of a gray area. Uh, and then of course, you guys talked in your presentations about the greenhouse gas emissions and people say it's a third or a, or a quarter of, of global uh, anthropogenic emissions. So you have, for instance, when you convert a natural habitat to, to, uh, to cropland, you get a lot of carbon dioxide emitted. You got the cows, we've already talked about them and their enteric fermentation that produce methane. You have incomplete denitrification of nitrogen fertilizers that produces nitrous oxide, laughing gas, which is a very potent uh, uh, greenhouse gas. And then of course we have use of fossil fuels to make, um, to run agricultural machinery and to make the nitrogen fertilizers. Then, of course, depending on how, how you do your farming, you may cause soil degradation, either through soil erosion, overgrazing, or uh, salinization, a buildup of salt in the soil. You may deplete local freshwater uh, reserves, uh, which is happening in the Western um, in North America right now. So you have rivers, lakes, and aquifers that are, that are basically being depleted. And then you have uh, the risk of fertilizer runoff that causes eutrophication when it reaches bodies of water, and that leads to algal blooms, and that in turn leads to, to these um, oxygen-starved regions and, and, and basically just dead zones, and you have algal toxins that, that contaminate the, the local uh, fauna and therefore the seafood. Uh, it's high maintenance. Uh, it requ agriculture requires soil. It requires fresh water. And this might sound really stupid, but it might become clear later. It requires light. And you also require specific climate conditions. It can't be too hot, it can't be too cold, it can't be too dry, it cannot be too wet. It has to be just, just right within, within certain limits. 
and there is a certain built-in inefficiency in agriculture. So there's low water uh, use efficiency because water, even if you do drip irrigation, you are going to lose water because water evaporates or it's taken up by com competing weeds or it just runs away in the soil. Same thing with fertilizer. You have competition from weeds and soil microorganisms who want to eat those nutrients. And again, you get runoff. And th again, this is going to be sound really stupid, but there is no photosynthesis at night, obviously. And for most crops, there is no photosynthesis after harvesting because you remove the crop and the field is just sitting there. It's being hit by sunlight, but it's not doing anything. And I see that as an inefficiency. And then finally, uh, we only eat a part of the uh, crop, which is called the harvest index. So there's a, there's a there, depending on what it is you're growing, there's, a, there's either a big or a small parts that you have to find a use for or just throw away. And then finally, agriculture is vulnerable, of course. Again, this year we've seen extreme weather events and that's going to affect crops. So you have heat waves, cold snaps, droughts, downpours. Then uh, crops are, are attacked by plant pests like insects, mites, nematodes, and then we have diseases that affect both our crops and our livestock. So we have all these, these stresses coming. And um, what keeps me up at night is I'm afraid that we're going to reach, with climate change, we're going to read a, a, a kind of a death spiral. So we have, we have a growing population, and we also have this trend of people wanting to eat more animal protein or consume animal protein. And what that results is we have an increased agricultural demand. And if we have an increased agricultural demand, that means we have to use more land for agriculture. And if we use more land for agriculture, we're going to emit more greenhouse gases. If we emit more greenhouse gases, we're going to have a warmer climate. And if we have a warmer climate, that is probably going to decrease our agricultural yields. That's what studies show. And what happens if our agricultural yields decrease? Well, we have to use more land to grow more crops. And then around we go again. If we grow more crops, we have more emissions. It gets warmer. The yields get even smaller. And then we have to grow even more land and so on. And so that is my fear that that's where we will end up. So now I've, <laughs> I've given agriculture a really hard time now. So now I'm going to tell you why microorganisms are so amazing. And it really comes down to one thing, and that is the bioreactor. Uh, so the, the key here is that a bioreactor is the vessel that where you grow the microorganisms is a closed system. And that means a lot. It means that you can pr precisely control what the environment is inside the bioreactor. So you can control the temperature, and any other cultivation parameter. You also, because it's sealed off, you don't lose water and you don't lose nutrients. And of course, it acts as a physical barrier against things we don't want to get in there, like other microorganisms that might compete with the ones we want to grow, or microorganisms that parasitize or, or, or predate our, um, our microorganisms. And I just want to show, so this, this, these are the two, inside these two buildings are the two uh, bioreactors that grow all the microprotein in the world. And these two bioreactors together produce enough food in terms of calories to, to feed about 26,000 people per day. So that's that's quite impressive. So let's let's now run through all these little um, you know little issues between agriculture and microbes. So let, let's let's start with land use, okay? So first thing, bioreactors have a very high product output than crops. So I'm going to give you the, the, um, the best example, which is this uh, bioreactor here. It's one of the largest ever built, 60 meters tall, an internal volume of 1,500 cubic meters. Uh, and they grew this bacterium here, which um, was used for animal feed in the UK in the 1980s. And if you look at just uh, uh, how much land you need to produce a certain amount of protein, the global average for soy is about 115 grams per protein per square meter per year. Now, if we just measure the, the surface behind this underneath this bioreactor, you're going to come down with about 200 million grams per square meter per year. So it's about if we just look at the bioreactor, it's about a factor million or two million more. But I should qualify that. That does not include, you're going to need energy to run this thing, and that's not included in that calculation. Also, 
these bugs needs a substrate to grow on, and that is also not factored into that. And I'm, I'd be happy to discuss that during the question time. Emissions, well, so potential sources of greenhouse emission, greenhouse gas emissions for edible microbes are, first of all, you have to build these bioreactors. So there's a lot of concrete and steel you need for that. Uh, you might need to synthesize growth substrates for them. So for instance, ammonia, hydrogen gas, and simple organic compounds. So that will require energy. Uh, if, if you use carbon dioxide as a um, direct or indirect substrate, you have to capture it, that requires energy. Of course, if you're capturing carbon dioxide, you might actually get a cancellation effect here. And then, of course, you need to maintain these. So you need to maintain the temperature inside the bioreactor. You need to mix it. Then it takes energy to harvest the, the microbial biomass from the bioreactor and process it. So, But this all, I'd say this very much depends on what energy source you want to use. So uh, if you want to use a zero emissions energy source, it should be entirely possible. I, I think that here it might be a difficult concrete and steel, you probably I don't think um, carbon-free uh, technologies for these are, are mature yet, so we probably can't get around that. But I think all these others, I think there are uh, renewable alternatives. So you could, you could, you could use those. Uh, what about land degradation? Well, again, so because you need such a tiny, tiny amount of land to produce this same amount of, of food in terms of, of microorganisms compared to crops, uh, maybe it's not something we need to care about if it's such a small geographical footprint. But also remember that we can put these bioreactors anywhere. So we can put them in rocky areas or arid areas where there is no soil that we need to worry about. Um, so so that's, that's another good thing. What about the water footprint? Well, again, these are closed systems, so we can minimize uh, water loss. There's zero, basically zero evaporation. There is a possibility to recycle water. Um, we also uh, have the possibility to use salt tolerant microorganisms. And in that case, we can use brackish or even um, salt water for cultivation. And then if we can use salt water for cultivation, then there is no water footprint. It, the, 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 it's solved. It's no problem at all. What about nutrient leakage? Well, again, they're closed systems. So, uh, and, and you can specifically regulate how much nutrients you add at what rate to the bioreactor, which means that you add just enough so that the microbes take it up. So you can get to pretty much 100% nutrient use efficiency. And then you get no nutrient leakage. And if you don't get nutrient leakage, you're not going to have nitrous oxide emissions, and you're not going to have eutrophication. And then what about external stress? Well, again, it's a closed system. So we don't care what the weather is outside the bioreactor. It can be a heat wave, it can be a cold snap, it can be a drought, it can be raining. We don't care. It's, it's the climate, we control the climate inside the bioreactor. So we can put those bioreactors anywhere. We can put them in deserts, we can pull them, put them in polar regions, we can put them out at sea, we can put them in caves, and we can put them in space. So the climate does not matter. And again, because they're closed systems, they are that physical barrier against other microorganisms that we don't want to get in there. Now, of course, there's always a risk of contamination, so you need backup systems, but there is an inherent uh, defense against these. So why then aren't we all eating microbes yet? Well, so the, the biggest problem actually is that people don't know that you can do this. So most people, and I, I include here so-called experts on global food security, just don't know that this technology exists. Um, then, I mean, people are sort of, um, there's moderate consumer demand for these things. So if you look at corn's microprotein has been around since uh, mid eighties. And um, sure, it's, it's I, as, a, as a vegetarian option, it's quite popular, but it's not like dominating our food aisles. And then finally, bioreactors are very expensive to build. But if you look in terms of how much food they can produce, and, and you, let's say you wanted to purchase um, cropland, which is quite expensive, um, you would be you would get approximately, uh, you pay approximately the same price if you bought a bioreactor to get the same output. So even though they're, they're expensive to build, uh, cropland is also expensive to buy. And with that, I think I'm going to stop now. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Thomas, for such an interesting presentation. 
And now you can ask questions. 